Hi, everyone. I hope you all can hear me. Um, welcome to the second event of this year's Visiting Writers series, a reading by Rajiv Mahabir. I'm Brandon Shimoda, assistant professor in the English department here at Colorado College, which sponsors the series and with the support from the McLean Visiting Writers Endowment. The Visiting Writers series is for the time being a virtual series. Previous readings can be found on our department's YouTube channel, which I'm gonna post that link in the chat right now. Um, you will find there, uh, among other readings, our last reading, which featured Nora Brooks Blakely in conversation um, with our own Professor Nate Marshall. I should mention that a broadside was made in conjunction with that reading of a poem by Brooks Blakely's mother, Gwendolyn Brooks. The poem Infirm is from Brooks's The Near Johannesburg Boy and Other Poems. And the broadside itself was made at the press at Colorado College and it is available here. Here's another link coming up. Before we begin, I want to invite everyone into an acknowledgement and a contemplation of the indigenous peoples of the land we are occupying. Colorado College is located within the unceded territories of the Ute peoples. The original inhabitants of the region commonly known as Colorado also include the Apache, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Comanche, Pueblo, and Shoshone peoples. Tribes whose territory extended into Colorado include the Kiowa and Navajo. And there are two federally recognized Native American tribes in Colorado today, the Southern Ute and the Ute Mountain Ute. By making these acknowledgements, we might begin and hopefully will continue to acknowledge the ways that our presence including as manifest in our creative and critical work is born upon the traditions, the knowledge and the resonant and ongoing energies of the indigenous peoples of this land. To quote my colleague, Natanya Pulley, when we acknowledge the land and first peoples, we also honor time and that cruel and beautiful way the past is never truly in the past, but carries forward to, to today, to right now. Tonight, we are very lucky to be hosting Rajiv Mahabir, who's going to be introduced by Paul O. Paul is a senior English major on the creative writing fiction track and is currently working on his thesis, which he describes as a sci-fi novel that explores ideas from critical theory through the lens of an android seeking autonomy. Brilliant. Uh, Paul has also been working at the press at CC where he helped to produce the aforementioned broadside of Gwendolyn Brooks's Infirm. Um, following Rajiv's reading, there will be a Q&A facilitated by Professor Aileen Lowe. So let's welcome Paul. Paul, take it away. Hello. Um, thank you, Professor Shimoda, for that introduction. Um, I'm here to welcome our guest for tonight. He is the winner of a number of prestigious awards for both his poetry and his prose, having most recently been awarded the New Immigrant Writing Award from Restless Books for his memoir, Anti-Man, published this past June. Anti-Man is a mesmerizing blend of genres using elements of poetry and memoir to explore themes of diasporic identity. Joining us here at CC for the year from Massachusetts, where he teaches at Emerson, please welcome Rajiv Mahabir. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Paul, for that introduction. And thank you to, to Brandon and to Aileen and to Erica and everybody who's made this uh, happen tonight for me. I'm so, I'm so honored to be here uh, with you uh, tonight to read from my memoir, Anti-Man. Um, and a little bit about the, the title of Anti-Man um, is that uh, it, it's a, a word that's used in the Caribbean, in the South Caribbean, to describe uh, men who love men or a kind of non-normative uh, sexuality uh, that is uh, oftentimes punished by uh, families and communities. Um, uh, and so I part of the work of this memoir is to rethink 
this uh, word as it as it's been used against people like me um, in my <clears throat> in my brown and black community uh, that I belong to of people from Guyana, South America. Um, one thing that you should probably know before I, I jump right into this reading also is that, as I said, my family is from a country in South America called Guyana. In the 1800s, after the British outlawed the transatlantic slave trade, at least in their own dealings and waters, um, they turned their greedy eye to the jewel of their crown, which was India, um, and to supplant uh, the, the, the newly freed descendants of enslaved African folks. Uh, they brought scab labor from India to work these sugarcane plantations by recycling the mechanisms of uh, chattel slavery. Um, and so what happened there was my ancestors in 1894 left from the ports in Kolkata and in 18, in, excuse me, 1864, uh, 1894 and uh, 18, um, uh, 86 from the, the, the port town of Madras in South India, carrying my ancestors to Guyana. Several generations later, uh, I am of Indo-Caribbean descent and now moving into North America. So this is kind of like the background uh, that the first you know couple hundred pages of my memoir kind of mires through. Uh, and so I'm gonna start with this part. It's called The Lover and the Chapbook. And this chapter is, we, by the time we get to this chapter, I have grown up in Central Florida. I've gone to India for the first time um, and I hadn't been to, my, no one in my family had been to India in over 120 years. Um, and I moved to New York City to be a teacher. Uh, all the while I was writing poetry and learning my grandmother, my Aji's songs and stories that I would record and sing back to her. So this is called The Lover and the Chapbook. I picked up my cell. Its blue glow pricked my eyes. I tossed the sheets away and stood up dizzy. It's 2 a.m. I could smell my own breath. I looked at the phone. It was Ryan. Rajiv? I don't know what to do. Silence, then a sob. I was used to the occasional phone call and check-in, but never at this time of night. I turned on the kitchen light. I sat at the breakfast nook table and gazed out, at the wind uh, out of the window. The courtyard of my apartment building glowed in the night. Rats scurried from the sewers into the garbage piles. I lit a cigarette. Are you okay? Are you safe? Ryan was fragile. His alienation in Baltimore was jarring after the promise of a South Asian community of activists in the city. The organizers promised us that we would always have space with them, that we would be welcome into their circles if we moved to New York. I had moved to New York and no one wanted to hang out. So much for promises. Stephen and I broke up. Isn't that a good thing? Ryan, haven't you wanted to break up with Stephen for some time now? I rubbed my eyes and shook my head. Why was he waking me up in the middle of a school night? I'm just so frustrated right now. I told him to leave my apartment. How did he take it? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I wrote him a letter that said, I don't have the emotional strength to continue this relationship anymore. I need you out. Ryan broke up with his boyfriend of two years with the letter he left on the mantle. Is there anything I can do, I asked, understanding his grief and relief. He finally had the courage to let this fucker go and he was overwhelmed with fear of being alone as well as manic joy. Can you come down here? It was Thursday. I had to teach in the morning. I'll come tomorrow for the weekend, I said, and we hung up. I boarded a, I boarded a Chinatown bus from Midtown to Baltimore. In my notebook, I kept a recording of my thoughts. I was thinking of Aji and her songs translating them into a language that I could use. I carried a cassette player with me and transcribed the lyrics to one of Aji's songs as I sat on the bus. I stopped the tape and wrote down one word at a time. There was one particular Kabir poem that she sang when I last saw her. It was a Chutney song that she had said had a deeper kind of meaning than just dancing. Chunri pehen ke piya se milwe, saya tumho chatura sayana, I tie my veil to meet my love. Love, no matter how clever, you will have to leave for your home. This kind of song was a nirgun, a song about death, but really about living. I had heard these kinds of songs in Varanasi. 
The overarching metaphor of the body is a veil permeated my thoughts. My body is a veil that I wear and discard, or at least this was the philosophy behind this kind of poem. New Jersey raced by the window as I, con as I considered impermanence. I liked teaching elementary school, but I wanted to leave it before I became a bitter teacher. The students deserved better than that. The Department of Education in New York City was a mess. Funding issues, racism, all the things to put the onus of making children learn on the shoulders of individuals instead of the system. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. When I moved to the city, I only wanted to live in New York for several years. There was somewhere else I could be. My cell phone buzzed, it was Seth. I silenced it. I'll call him later, I thought. Seth is a, another um, boy that I used to tangle with. Outside, Jersey Rush passed. I thought of the road trips that I had taken with my parents and siblings in the past. This was different. The bus was peopled by travelers like me, those who wanted to save a dime and those who wanted to bring old school boom boxes to blast the latest Chinese hits for our long crawl down the Eastern seaboard. Those who were finally meeting themselves in a big city. The road lasted the length of this translation and I began to write my own Nirgun poems. The bus dropped me in a parking lot of an abandoned grocery store and Ryan came with his friend Shana to, 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 to collect me. We hugged and crawled into Shana's car and sped off to Ryan's apartment. She dropped us off and went home to get ready for the evening. Ryan's two bedroom was dark and smelled like grief. He went to the kitchen without kicking off his shoes and poured us both whiskey gingers. I walked from the living room to the bedroom. The brightly colored furniture helped to alleviate the sense of mold and despair that crept in the shadows, poised for descent the moment the light switched off. The queen size bed was stuffed with pillows. Ryan walked in and handed me my glass. On the other side of the wall, he motioned, was where Stephen slept before he left. I could feel his evil emanate from that wall. Ryan took a sip. Drink up, he continued. We have a lot of work to do. I sipped and looked at the photos on his dresser. Stephen was a white hipster with blonde brown hair, blue eyes, and stretched earlobes that fit blue plugs. He could make me come real fast, Ryan admitted as he turned the photos down. Now he's gone. Are you going to stay here? Why don't you move to New York? I was hopeful. It would, be a it would be great to be able to stumble home drunk with him after nights of dancing. No, I'm going to stay in Baltimore. I got to get the hell out of this place, though. Are you okay? I'm great, Rajiv. No, really. How are you? Really? Ryan bowed his head. Sweat collected at his temples. With a, laugh, with a laugh, he flung his head back and shot the rest of his drink down his throat. You know, Rajiv, I've started to write poems about him. He pointed to the bookshelf that housed a dusty stereo and five books. Under a figurine of an elephant, a pile of papers gleamed. Ryan walked over and pulled them out. I've written about 13 by now, he said. You have to read them. Uh, invite your friends and you should have a reading in your living room. My excitement grew at the prospect of Ryan writing his poems. I'm hoping to make them into a little book, like a small book that can fit into my back pocket. I would definitely buy that book. I took out my journal. I've been jotting things down, but they're only scribbles for now. I wish that I could make you, I, I wish that I could make them more a part of my life. Rajiv, you totally can. No, is in con no one is in control of what you want to do. Ryan opened his eyes wide. It was a serious face. You're already a poet. He picked up my journal and he read for a few seconds that felt as though he was looking into my ears and examining my head. You have to leave your home, he mouthed. I knew just what he was reading. He closed the journal and put it on the table. Yep, just as I thought. What's the hesitation though? I looked at the floor, I'm not sure. I've been reaching for, I've been teaching for a while now and I don't know. I don't even know who will read poems if I were to write them. Ryan grabbed my hand. I will read them. He looked into my eyes with his serious face again. He meant business. Write for people like you and me. I thought of the present, I thought of the present that Layla had sent me three years before. There was a queer Guyanese poet who wrote, I could do this maybe. I said, 
but I want to hear your poems first. Yes, but after I read, we are going out because I need to dance, Ryan said. Jonathan and Shana arrived at the apartment within minutes. Jonathan greeted Ryan with a firm hug and offered me his lily white hand in greeting. Shana's hair was aflame with red and orange and her very presence scalded me. Hey there, you both look a little dry, Ryan said and slipped into the kitchen to prepare more drinks. He had changed into a short pink t-shirt and a darker pair of Levi's. I wrung my hands and my palms started to sweat whiskey. Hi guys, I said. You're Rajiv from Queens. I've heard so much about you. Jonathan whined and passed by me to sit on the couch. His thin frame looked like his shirt could break his shoulders. His milky skin betrayed his blue veins hard at work. Rajiv, Shana said and slapped my hand, palm to outside hand to palm to outside hand to fist bump. I fumbled and did the handshake wrong, confounded by her beauty. Do you also write poems? I do, but I definitely don't show them to anyone. I look down at my silver and black sneakers. So how exactly do you know Ryan? Asked Jonathan from the couch, one leg crossed over the other. I mean, I know that Ryan goes to visit you in New York and that you're a second grade teacher, but I never heard the story of how you met. He narrowed his ice blue eyes. We met at a conference for South Asian activists in New York a couple of years ago. Our being outside of the South Asian norm brought us together. And since then we've been connected. Ryan emerged, the ice clinked a song in the whiskey gingers he handed to his guests, the promise of fresh condensation and a dulling of sadness. We were both on the outside, not really fitting the mold of who we should be or what people think we are, you know? You don't lose a connection like that when you make one, Ryan said with a grin and a laugh. It's true, I thought. In some way, we saved each other from expectation and disappointment. Ryan must have felt like a three-headed green monster who wore a mask. What would this white Jonathan know of being on the outside? That's very nice, he said, nice. He could have also said the word quaint or exotic. I glared at him and then at Ryan. I could feel the veins erupt on my forehead and my eyes redden. Nice, Ryan laughed. It's more than just nice. Ryan loved this boy as a friend for some reason. <sighs> Maybe I should give him a chance too. I was reading meaning into his words, call it, call it a post-traumatic response to the wild bird of jealousy beating against my throat. Psh, Shana said and put her hand in Jonathan's knee. You know that being outside of the norm makes you close to others that are freaks like you. She went in for a hug. Jonathan tightened and loosened his posture. These three were a unit. Shayna and Jonathan took care of Ryan while he was going through this breakup. And I loved them for it, despite myself. What about these poems, Shayna asked, looking at Ryan, then at me. I was hoping you would forget, Ryan laughed into his drink. He took a sip and put his glass on the coffee table, ringed with marks of cup sweat. He reached his hand into his back pocket and pulled out a stack of poems that he unfolded. Ryan stood up in front of the fireplace that had been painted over. I wanted to make this kind of book that fits into your pocket, he said, the voice, his voice trembling ever so slightly. I wondered if Jonathan could hear the slight falter. How well did he actually know my Ryan? Ryan began, this one is called Birth and it's about my birth parents. I noticed his stance, his posture and his voice's tremble. He delivered the poem in a musical cadence. His poem asked his parents if they knew about him, if they thought about him after abandoning him for adoption. His poem asks his birth parents questions about living in India, puzzling through what he could have inherited from them. I looked at Jonathan and he was wiping his eyes. Shana was staring at Ryan, her eyes two full moons. My throat was a collapsed mine shaft. Ryan was dealing with many nuanced layers of abandonment as he called out to his parents. Ryan shot his drink and put down his glass. Who needs another one? He trembled after he finished and zipped to the kitchen for more alcohol. I had lost count of how many drinks he'd had. He was exposed. He stood naked in front of us and we looked at his parts, inspecting them and thinking of our own burns and scars. That was brave, Jonathan said standing up and rushing into the kitchen to hug Ryan. I sat on the couch and reflected. 
I stared at my own journal that was on the coffee table earlier. I had not heard many other queer South Asian poets. Something about Ryan allowing himself to write his stories felt freeing. Something about Ryan allowing himself to his, uh, something broke inside of me, excuse me. It was fear being seen. If Ryan could be brave, so could I, at least in front of my friends. He didn't care what the end game of his poems was. Maybe I could be free to just write them, write my own poems, and to not care. My parents' words haunted me. You need to know the difference between what's a career and what's a hobby. I was the one policing this message. It was injected into my thinking, and I was the one who polished the idea until it gleamed, outshining any ideas that I had for myself. I got up and held out my hand to Shana, who, with a flourish, stood up. We trotted off to the kitchen. Ryan and Jonathan were still hugging. Well, it's time for me to go, Shana spoke up, eyeing me. That was really exceptional, Ryan. You have a gift. I'd never thought of writing as a gift, but, as, but a skill and a bravery that you have after refusing to burn up in flame. It was like an act against death. Let's walk together, Jonathan said to Shana, loosening his grip on Ryan's waist. You guys, you guys don't want to go out with us? We're going to go dance. Ryan's words started to slur together. Nah, you guys go and slay him, Shana said. They put their jackets on and left our apartment. As soon as they left, I looked at Ryan, I looked at Ryan and said, Jonathan is in love with you. I know. And? I'm done with white boys for now. Come on. I began smiling into my glass as I drained it to its last brown flame. Stephen used to like to fuck me when I wore a bindi. Ryan said blankly. There was no arguing with this. This was pretty unforgivable. In the Baltimore gutter scene, Ryan and I danced and danced. By the time we left the apartment, I had no idea where I was or what I was doing. None of it mattered. Baltimore was a sticky city with an electronic gutter music scene that kept us sweating and dancing for our lives. I was celebrating the breakage in me, the permission to write the ugly and to share it with my friends, Amidst the din and fog of the club, I remembered what an astrologer had told me in India. He said that I have an artistic palm, but my problem was, was that I had to commit to one form, form of art, that if I did, then I would go far. I thought of the art that I would commit, I thought that the art that I would commit to would be astrology originally, but now something else was happening. I was moved by Ryan's openness and was now moving my way through this process by dancing. Something else broke for me too. I wanted Ryan. At seven in the morning, we stumbled back over the cracked sidewalk to, Ryan, to Ryan's apartment. We had stopped drinking and were exhausted. We crumbled onto heaps on his couch. I really loved your poems tonight, I said. I leaned in. You are amazing and I love you so much. And I meant it. You keep writing too. I see you always writing things down in your journal. He was an artist and restless like me. It was, a, it was bright and we were both ready for bed. I kissed Ryan. As he came, the church bells tolled 8 a.m. outside. I boarded the Chinatown bus back to New York. I was glad to return with my new resolve. I could allow myself to be a writer. I could be a poet. Ryan held me tight, Ryan had held me tight and told me that he loved me too, and that he was lucky that I was in his life. We didn't have to tell each other this. We were so close that my tasting him didn't complicate anything between us. As Baltimore began to blur, I reached up and pulled off my hat and fixed my hair. The bald spot was big. Outside a hawk flew high above the bus and followed us. It felt like a message from the divine that I must allow poetry to be a reality for my life. I felt my head again. I pulled out my journal. What would I write? I flipped through my notebook and saw my translations and transcreation of Aji's folk songs. I had been writing this whole time. My head swam. Through translation, journaling, or writing poems and fragments, I had been writing all along. 
Since Emily, my sister, gave me my journal before I went to India, since I sat with a tape recorder with Aji and penned down her lyrics for translation, I hadn't been able to see myself without my reflection through a beloved until Ryan held up a mirror to my face. It felt as though my consciousness was looking at my own life from a hawk's perspective. I could see that this whole time I had been alive on this earth that I had been writing. I was tied to poetry from my umbil um, umbilicus. I just hadn't recognized it. Aji's songs and stories were poetry that I was working with and it was working through me. It was the poetry that I descended from and I could hear its music inside me as I read my own words. Had I always been surrounded by poetry in many languages? I was so used to overlooking what I was doing, thinking that I wasn't able to write, that I was not good enough, that I was not enough. I rubbed my head and was frustrated by the hair loss. I made a promise to myself right there on the road from Baltimore to Jackson Heights in Queens, New York, this hawk as my witness. I would shave my head when I returned to Jackson Heights as a reminder to dedicate myself to poetry. Um, one of the things that I am going to kind of move into now is I'm going to uh, read one of the translations of my grandmother's songs that she that she sang for me. Um, and this is called Aji's recording, How Will I Go? And it's also one of these sasural kind of songs that uh, people would usually sing like uh, to the bride or for the bride in the voice of the bride as the bride moves into the house of her husband after um, you know, the old, the old uh, uh, wedding ceremonies would happen. Um, also, this is, a, this is also one of those metaphorical nirgun poem songs uh, that I was that I had translated in that chapter that I had just read for you. Um, and bear with me while I, while I sing through this. You're going to hear part in Guyanese Hindi, Guyanese Hindustani, or my grandmother's language, Guyanese Bhojpuri. Then you're going to hear the transformation into my Creole, or my family Creoles, and then um, my English translation at the very end. How will I go? Dulahan rowe rowe piya ke ghare jana Kahe ke rowe piya ke ghare jana Piya ke ghare jana Piya ke ghare jana Kahe ke rowe piya ke ghare jana Dulahan rowe rowe piya ke ghare jana Sasur mare mare baas danda leke Sasur mare mare nana ghari aave Piya ke ghare jana, piya ke ghare jana Kahe ke roe, piya ke ghare jana Saiya ma, mare mare baas danda leke Saiya mare gale me bhaiya andal ke Piya ke ghare jana, piya ke ghare jana Kahe ke roe, piya ke ghare jana kaise hum jaibo sasural chunri me lagal dag kaise hum chipao chunri me lagal dag piya ke ghare jana piya ke ghare jana kahe ki roe piya ke ghare jana dulahan cry for goi husband house and he cry and he cry father and mother in law just them this beat me sister in law just sent insult my husband does give me lash with one piece bamboo. My husband does beat me up, he grab my throat. How me go go me far in la, me or get one stain. How me go hide am, me or get one stain. The bride cries. She must go to her lovers. She cries because she must go. My in-laws will beat me. My sister-in-law will curse me. The bride cries. She must go to her lovers. She cries because she must go. My love will hold my neck and beat me with a bamboo rod. My in-laws will beat me. My sister-in-law will curse me out. The bride cries. She must go to her lovers. How will I go to my in-laws with a stained veil? How will I hide it? the stain in my veil. The bride cries, 
she must go to her lovers. She cries because she must go. Uh, one of the things about my Aji that I will say is that, um, you know, she was unlettered um, and did not read and write in any of the languages that she spoke. And her languages include Guyanese Creole, or as she called it, Creolese, um, and Hindustanis, the language that she spoke. Um, you know, also academics call it Guyanese Bhojpuri, which is another one of the violences put on uh, my grandmother. But uh, to kind of move into how I've taken these songs uh, and made them um, and to trans translated them and transposed them into kind of like an oeuvre where I feel, um, you know, that I'm, I'm nesting right now as a poet and a writer is through, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I hope you don't mind if I read um, a poem um, from Cutlish, which is in my new book of poems that has just come out, but it ties in um, into here. And the speaker of this poem, it was the Rajiv who, you know, have rode that Baltimore bus and who maybe two years after that, um, you know, wrote this poem in memorandum. And this is called Kabira. So it's a kind of poem that's based on <clears throat> this kind of uh, spirituality where God has no form, this idea of going to um, the next place uh, and, you know, and our body being a veil. This is um, my poem in offering and it's based on a Chutney song, which is a kind of, which is a kind of music in the Caribbean. Um, you know, you've probably heard of Soka and uh, Carnival, um, you know, in this time, Soka Chutney is also what's played and uh, performed there. And this is called Kabira. You'll hear the, the chorus of this song in Caribbean Hindustani, and you'll hear um, at the very, very end of the poem, the translation in, or transformation into English. Kabira. Hateli yan ki mehendi halki hoike gaya. E sariravame bhala kartikar. You will your house of clay and breath, a fortress. One day, ash and smoke will play fire games in the courtyard. Remember this hovel is of five senses. Does wind stay trapped in a room when its windows yawn? Without country, it flows as river water, a traceless origin. How can this structure of earth and bone be home? The poet Kabir says, however beautiful, gold or silver, when the cage door cracks, what bird stays inside? The palm's mehendi lightens, then disappears. What permanence is in your body. Thank you. And I think that ends my uh, reading portion for this evening. And thank you for thank you for being present with me and for admiring uh, through uh, you know this this story, the songs and the poems. Thank you so much, Rajiv. That was such a great reading. And um, I was telling all my students that that I heard you read before and that they would not be disappointed. And um, I don't think I oversold it. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, we do have time for, for um, questions. So as this is a webinar, you can use the, the Q&A chat function to type them in. Um, and I will do my best to, to catch up with them and, and read them out to um, Rajiv so that he doesn't have to focus on that. You can think about how you'd like to respond to them. Um, and I have questions too, but but I'm actually going to pivot to my students who I had them like come up with some questions as we were wrapping up class today. As I as I told you, we've been reading two excerpts from your text or from this new memoir, um, and so uh, I'll I'll start with a well, let's start with an easier question perhaps, which is. Uh, we are really interested in, in the hybrid memoir and um, what you were doing with like layering the poetry and the songs and the translations and then the prose. And, and so we, there are a lot of questions from my students about what that process was like for you and, and why the, the like hybrid nature of this memoir. 
Yeah, thank you. I actually stumbled into writing a memoir. It was not an intention that I had. Um, and so like many of these chapters and the poems and the translations were all part of like separate things that I had been doing since, you know, I was, since I was young. Um, you know, I started recording my Aji when I was in my early 20s, maybe even 20. Actually, yeah, I was 20 years old <clears throat> um, when I started recording her and doing that. And so I never thought that one day it would be a project or it would be like in a memoir. Um, and so it all kind of came about when um, a friend of mine sat me down. Well, so my first book of poems uh, came out in 2016, but in 2014, a dear friend and mentor of mine, Rigoberto Gonzalez, said to me that, you know, I was living in Hawaii at the time. Um, and he said, you know, if you want to have a kind of presence in the on the continental United States, a good thing to do is to write essays and to publish them while you're while you're there. So people will like get to know your name. And it's like, you know, all done in the service of poetry, I'll say. Um, and so a friend of mine who actually non writing nonfiction was her 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 main bag. Her name is uh, Anjali Roy, and she has a chat book out that's just fabulous from um, um, uh, uh, the operating system. Um, she told me to put them all together and see what happened. And so like I printed all of these pages out and I was like, oh, this is something. It, it, it all focuses on like a 10 year span of my lifetime. When I lived in these cities, I lived in you know Orlando and Gainesville and Varanasi, India, and I moved to New York City. And so I was like, huh, that was like a time where I was also discovering writing and poetry as like something that I was allowed to do and something that I had been doing all of this time. So the hybrid nature of this memoir was really like, it's honest in it's the way that I put it together after the fact of thinking about it as a project. Like all of these little pieces were just little pieces in my mind and it really took an outside eye to be like, oh, there's something here. And then of course, in the editing process, I tried to make it be a little bit more, um, uh, whole uh, and not so piecemeal. Like, you know, as a poet, I'm thinking, you know, abstractly, I think about helicopter views of how to organize disparate pieces or different pieces together in order to increase resonance and, um, you know, maybe increase distraction. Because perhaps that's like what I want. Um, but what I what I found myself doing, and it was only, it was only after I, I put it together that after the actual like real kind of horrific moments um, of this memoir, like the emotionally horrific mo moments is when poetry kind of erupted. And I was like, huh, you know, this is how poetry has always been in my life. It's been, you know, that place where I would go to maybe have control over time and, 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 and the, 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 the narrative, if there is narrative um, words and that kind of thing. The translations were important for me to include because <clears throat> that is how I came through all of this. This is the poetry that I, I grew up knowing. Um, and so the translation had to be part of it. Now, the transcriptions, those were the first things that I had done. Uh, the recordings were the first things that I had ever done in my writing life. Um, and they were the last things that I had typed up on the computer. Um, you know, to put into this manuscript, because I was like, how could I have so much about my Aji and not actually have her voice? So the hybridity of this just kind of, um, kind of happened, because I guess that's the way that I've been thinking about my life in these like little tiny pieces that when I kind of take a step back, do that helicopter view, it's, I see more interaction than I had originally intended, which is, you know, the gift of putting things down and then coming back to them and having people read them for you. So I don't know if that really answers the question. That's more about like the process instead of like why it's important, I think. No, I th actually think you did both of that, which is really helpful. Um, and this kind of gets you to talk a little bit more about the process too, but the students were also wondering if you had written these poems before, or I guess during, right? Or if they came as part of like the memoir writing? Yeah, so um, I think all of the poems happened before the memoir became a memoir. So that the, the, there's a poem in the end called Barsi, which is a Barsi is a tr uh, uh, like a ceremony that you do uh, uh, an entire calendar year after the, pa after the passing of a beloved person. Um, and so that was actually the Barsi poem that I had written for my Aji when she passed. So that was there. Um, and uh, 
you know, the Amazon River Dolphin. So there's another poem there called the Amazon River Dolphin. That was written, you know, after I had, I had just left New York um, in 2013. I was living in Honolulu as a student at the University of Hawaii when I started to write that. And then there's another the one called Ardhanarishwaram Raga. And so these two poems are based on South Indian ragas. Um, and, and they say that like, if you sing the ragas right, then magical things will happen. So, um, you know, uh, Ganga and the Samp is also one of those. There's one called um, It's a, a Nagapambi, I believe it's called. Uh, uh, and if you sing it correctly and you have, and, and the performance is just right, you can call cobras to you. Um, and there's similarly, there's a raga like Ananda um, Amrita uh, Varshini. If you sing it correctly, then the rains will fall. And so I took these like ragas, you know, that have lyrics that are changeable, um, you know, and I, and I thought about those as things to write into. And what emerged for me were these fam family connections um, through, you know, my South Indian heritage on my mom's side and what that meant for us. And actually my connection to my mother and then her family. And so those are the poems that came later. Thank you. Um, I know there's a, a question in the Q&A, but I'm gonna actually combine that with something else in a second. Um, this is another question from my students who, I know you're out there, so you can just type this into the Q&A too, but I'm happy to also use my note card students. Um, and I would encourage other audience members to, to ask questions too. This is such a great opportunity to, to talk to a writer and especially a writer like Rajiv. So, um, and this is the harder question for you, which is, who are you speaking to when you write um, about difficult stories, particularly of your family's colonization? And then the second part is, you know, how do you care for yourself in the writing process? Oh, God, I love these questions. Thank you so much. Oh, my God. And especially that second question, like, okay, that second question is so... Oh, I've been I've been thinking about it so much, but I'll start about that. I, I love that. Um, who am I thinking of? I'm, I'm like, as I'm writing about colonization and living past this, I mean, because the, the lexicon that I'm using is not one for unlettered people like in my community, right? It's not for them um, in, in that, uh, that it, it, it's probably not always 100% accessible, which is another reason why I'm happy to blend all of these things in because imagine if my Aji were alive and she could see that her Creoles and her Hindustani were published in a book in the United States, she would be like, how is this even possible? So part of part of that is for, for her, right? You know, um, to that validation to be like, look, Aji, like you were a whole person, you're not broken. Like, you know, you told yourself you were. Um, and the other part that I, the other person that I write this for is actually for myself, because like, even though these are the, the these are truths, they're hard won. And, um, you know, I have so much uh, post-colonial baggage, uh, you know, as somebody being Indo Indian from the Caribbean, that um, it's also to remind myself, we're a younger Rajiv, that like, look, there there is a wholeness, right? And that wholeness is one of creolization. And you don't have to be fragmented. You don't have to think of yourself as being fragmented. You don't have to believe the, 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 the bullshit uh, that has been spoon fed to you, um, you know, by uh, assimilation, assimilationist parents who would side on, um, you know, forgetting all of this stuff. So those are two folks uh, that I would read to, that I, I, write, I write to. I also write to people in my like ethnic community in New York City, because like, uh, there are a dearth, there's a dearth of Indo-Caribbean writing in the United States. Um, there are no other poets in the United States who are Indo-Caribbean who are publishing books of poetry at nationally recognized presses. So it's like about creating a platform as well so that we can see each other and say, yes, our Creoles and our Hindusanis are flawed and beautiful and perfect. Um, and so that's like another thing, or I mean, maybe that's a hope. Maybe that's my hope. And then to the second part, or the second question here about like how I take care of myself. Well, um, there's certain passages of the book that I just don't read aloud. I was thinking tonight about like talking, reading part of Anti-Man, the title story. And I was like, I don't know if I could do it. I just don't know if I can do it. It's like it, it something in me has like the, that, that Anti-Man spirit hasn't yet settled. Um, it hasn't been outside of my body long enough that I could let it go. 
you know, it's a, it's the story that will teach me how to free myself from it. Um, and so I think part of that journey for me was having it out in the world. And so actually part of writing the story was the self-care and custodianship of this story, if that makes sense, if, if, it's, if that's not too meta. But there are like actual things that I did to ground my body. Like um, when I was drafting this uh, story, the, the, the memoir and the essays, you know, I, I, um, I lived in um, uh, Hawaii, like I said, and so, Part of what I would do is um, my partner was a gar like, would like to, love to garden, and so he had this garden in the Manoa Valley. It's like super rainy. It's it's in um, this beautiful valley of emerald mountains. We would go and we would work the earth with our hands, and then we would come home and we would make food from the vegetables that he grew that we both harvested together. You know, on stolen land, on um, occupied land, um, and so. Uh, that was one of the ways that I could take care of myself was to, to do that. There was also a kind of resonance that I was able to do coming from a plantation uh, community or um, a family that has history on the plantation. Um, and that was to have my own history resonate with the people around me. So a lot of the writers that I connected with in Hawaii were my friends, right? And they were indigenous folks from the Pacific. They were, they were also um, uh, descendants of indenture from the Hawaiian islands as well. So these conversations that I, were have, I was having about my family and this history was really, really helped through and like, you know, I mean, midwifed through by this wonderful community of writers of Kanaka OED people and, um, you know, uh, Asian American folks who, you know, nurtured me in Hawaii. Thank you. I'm gonna to turn to the, some of the questions posted and this is one of the first ones and, um, and I might just, if I may, I combine it with a question I had too. The question is what different languages did Aji speak? Um, and I know you had said them, but I think this person wanted to just hear that again. And then the, I'm gonna piggyback on this by asking, gosh, just how you were able to intertwine them, right? And I was so impressed in your reading because you were just like shifting between these three different languages. And, um, but even just on the page and, and as this, like a writer, right? Like how these languages are like intermingled or maybe like kept separate in your mind. Yeah, so, um, well, thank you for this. The, 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 the languages that my grandmother spoke are there, we have so many names for them. Um, we call them broken English, we call it broken Hindi. Those are not the names of the language. Academics call these languages Guyanese Creole and Guyanese Bhojpuri, but, my Aji, the speaker of these languages, called these languages Creolese and Hindustani. So it's like these like different layers of who gets to call the language what. So I mix up what my grandmother says and what um, you know academics say, depending on where I am. Um, and so uh, the second part of your question about how do I keep these separate is that I don't always. Um, in that, like, I think about, uh, you know, there are portions in here of the transcription where you can see my auntie going back and forth between Creolese and Hindustani just in like what she's saying. She'll say something and then she'll like start singing a part in Hindustani and then come back to Creolese. And so this is how those languages have work together. And so part of, um, you know, my, 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 my poetry is to, uh, uh, and my, my whole kind of idea around language is that um, we are not broken, we have never been broken, and we will never be broken. Um, and the ways that we tell stories are important, and the ways that we have been taught to forget how to tell our stories creates a void and a vacuum inside of us. What if we actually trusted our grandparents again? Instead of, you know, oh, well, what does the book say? What does this book say? What does that book say? So for me, uh, it's about intentionally coming back to the braiding. So... That's how I would answer that. Thank you. Um, this is another question from our audience, which is um, what difficulties have you faced writing about LGBTQ content? Well, I mean, it's, that's, there are a lot of difficulties because a lot of it is about telling, you know, telling your own story and other people wanting to have control over the, over the narrative um, of who you are and how you fit. Um, and so, I mean, part of that is like maybe my very North American understanding of self and like individuality, but then also like there's a community responsibility as well 
that I think that I need to have a kind of to show up for as well. Um, and so there are these community organizations that have been really wonderful about this. Like, so the Caribbean Equality Project, for example, was one of these in New York City who's really interested in the, 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 the stories of queer Caribbean folks. Um, and so, you know, there, those are some places that I get um, uh, solace or I can be seen wholly. But yeah, I mean, it's dangerous. It is dangerous to write. LGBTQ content, right? Um, it, it's dangerous to, to write queer, brown, brown queer sex in the United States. It's very anti-immigrant. That's, you know, very homophobic, despite the pink washing that goes on here, you know, um, as though the United States is some paragon of equality. Um, and so uh, I, I, I will say it, it categorically most, it, it absolutely is not. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's like that risk of being exposed and also in a very homophobic community as well of like Indo-Caribbean people or Caribbean folks. Um, it's not, every, not everything is so rosy and accepted. Like, so for example, I don't really have um, a relationship with my father. Um, and so part of the danger here is like writing about him, right? Like that is very risky. And so like he told me once to never attribute anything I become to him. But like, I will say the irony there is that like that kind of statement actually made me strive for this kind of literary kind of success. So anyway, so I, maybe I'm talking too much and I'm glad that I can't see everyone's faces because I would be too shamefaced to say that aloud to a, a bunch of faces looking back at me. So. Thank you. Um, another question from our audience, much of your connection to Guyanese-ness and in some ways brownness in the memoir is through a preservation of the past via language. So I'm curious about how you might configure a diasporic identity that's invested in forward-looking affirmations of Guyanese-ness or brownness. And Yeah, thank you. Wow, this question, I feel as though, um, you know, I don't see this as an act of preservation, which is interesting categorically. And so people who study the Caribbean like to say things like, oh, this is a remnant from India. This is not a remnant from India. This was actually a song that my grandmother spoke in her, uh, a so that songs and stories that my grandmother told during her life, which overlapped with my life. Um, I think that, you know, to forget your language and to, told, to be told that your language is um, not uh, worth being spoken and remembered is a colonial violence that I am trying to undo in my own generation for myself. So in a way, this is not backwards facing for me. Um, and in fact, I do see this to be forward facing and very progressive um, because the thing is it allows for diversity of a Guyanese person and nationality, right? I mean, so uh, the thinking through the idea of, uh, you know, the kind of assimilationist bent where folks are like, well, we're in the United States now speak English. That is a violence that actually, you know, we have all my people in my family have felt very profoundly in so much that we don't even acknowledge this fact. Um, you know, my parents both have American names that they go by. I have an American name that I go by um, that my parents gave to me because they didn't want me to experience racism on the throne. So I think that like reclaiming you know, what has been kind of, what what has, what has folks have tried to erase from me is um, not necessarily, uh, you know, preservationist, uh, 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 but rather it, it, it moves into a more connectedness with Guyana and with brownness in general, in that what would it look like to look at our history with realizing that we are full and whole and that every part of us has um, space here. Um, it's funny because I I was uh, in I was being interviewed by a, another Caribbean another queer Caribbean person who asked me um, you know if my Indianness was in fact a a hindrance to my being queer and I thought like wow what a question like that's no not at all in fact why can't I be all of the things at once so anyway that's that's kind of that's kind of my thought about that but thank you for this question I mean because it's a lot it's. It's something that a lot of people would like to, to think, especially with Christianization of brown communities in Guyana when the missionaries came. Like, so in my family, in my father's family, um, like you'll see, they, the missionaries set up shop on my dad's father's property. Um, and the only way to get an education was to convert to Christianity and to like look at everything Hindu and Indian as backwards or Muslim for that matter, as being backwards. So, you know, that's a, that's a big psychological scar. 
Thank you. And that actually ties well with this next question, um, which I'm going to read all of it because part of it is a compliment to you. So it says, thank you for the beautiful reading. Um, I was struck that in the acknowledgement you foreground the occupied lands you were writing from. Uh, sorry, I wonder how you approach different experiences of um, colonialism, settler colonialism, without reinforcing silos or flattening out the specificities. Yes, thank you for this question. And it's a super important question, um, especially as we are occupiers on native land um, and occupiers of native land. Um, and what are things that we can do in order to give back to indigenous communities where we are um, you know, taking up resources from the people, the original caretakers of the land and the caretakers of the land who are here and the caretakers of the land who will remain here when we are not here. Um, and so that's a good question. Um, for, for me, it's community-based. Um, who, who are the people that I am in communication with? Um, you know, so for example, um, you know, that uh, acknowledgement that I wrote, I sent to a friend to look over and she gave me an idea of what to say and what not to say, how to write about the 30 meter telescope and how not to write about it. In a, a forthcoming book of poems, I do, I do write a poem in acknowledgement of the land of Hawaii, the Aloha Aina that's there. Um, and how do I handle this responsibly? Um, and the thing is, it's not that one person can say yes or no, that this is like a thing that you can or can't do. Um, I think that for me, it has to do with research. Um, and that's the, the, the most important thing that I need to do. Like, what are the forms of writing that are, that are there for the people that I'm, whose land I'm living in? So, you know, part of this memoir, like I said, was written in Hawaii. Part of it was edited in, um, uh, on uh, Muscogee land in Alabama. Um, and, uh, you know, how, how do I think through that Settler occupation has been really important. I've been in, I've been in conversations with you know Creek writers or Muskogee writers as well. Um, the one thing that I'm, I'm I'm learning about now and where I am at the moment, I'm outside of Boston. I'm on um, uh, I work in Massachusetts land, um, but my where I'm living now is actually land of the Pawtucket Confederacy that extends from um, you know the Blue Hill here all the way up to. Um, yeah, Nova Scotia, I believe. And so looking for ways to bring that um, uh, that knowledge into an attunement to what I'm writing now is actually at the heart of my next project. Um, thinking about what does it mean to have settler colonial responsibility and to, to realize where the people are now, who are their writers right now, and who were their writers at the time. And so there's this wonderful anthology that I have, it's called Domland Voices. Um, and it's a it's a collection of writings from the people from the northeast of the United States. And so this is this is be how I be am beginning my my um, my 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 discovery of my own ignorance of this land's history. So um, that's one of the ways. And I think yeah, it's it. These are questions that you need to always be answering. You know, Eve Tuck and um, Wang. In, in their article of that says decolonization is not a metaphor, they ask, they, they say specifically that all of our liberations are not necessarily mutually tied to one another's. How can we show up for one another, but how can we realize when um, our our own personal, where, our, where the extents are of our accompliceship or allyship um, lie? And I think that's an important question to ask as well. Thank you. I know we're nearing our time or are at time, but um, if you wouldn't mind, I'm gonna try to combine these two um, questions that came up and I'll, so I'll read them, Rajiv, so they're kind of long, but I'll read them and then we'll, we'll, we'll see if we need to like digest them a little bit. Um, the first is, do you have advice on writing about personal ties to West Indian communities as a first generation American? Also, do you have advice on writing about West Indian proverbs or sayings that aren't easy to translate into English or feel hard to get across without background context. Um, but I think this does, the latter part does tie to um, Professor Islam's question. Um, and the so she writes, thanks for this beautiful reading. My students and I were talking about the creative potential of creolization as processed this afternoon. Creolization as undisciplined, creolization at, as that which exceeds the search for a singular authentic identity. So to hear you talk about a kind of wholeness facilitated by creolization is truly wonderful. Her question is, could you talk to us a little bit about translation, what goals or desires you guide, or what goals or desires guide the choices you make when translating 
Um, I'm asking this in relation to the translation of your Aji songs, as well as your translation of um, Alal Bihari Sharma song, uh, songs in I Even Regret Night. Oh my goodness, so wonderful. That, well, but it, it was a question, <laughs> questions about translations, right? And um, and questions about like writing from, writing with about personal ties to West Indian communities. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, hi Najneen, thank you so much for being here. I met Najneen in, um, in Guyana when we were both there in 2019, when we could still travel. Um, and it's lovely to, to know um, that you're here. Um, so basically like my advice that I would have to first generation West Indian people with <laughs> writing about our communities is that do it. Like, I mean, you know, um, I was always told, you know, as a bad thing, you not get shame, you not get shame as a bad thing. But like, truly, I don't have shame. <laughs> and so it's kind of like, you know, do I need to translate that in its oeuvre to the reader? I don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily think so all the time. I certainly don't. Um, and I let things be Easter eggs for those West Indian readers who are, you know, coming up and, you know, being told again that, you know, our languages aren't right enough for the American Academy and that like the way that we think of the world and our literary devices, you know, the Calypso that, you know, that is really part of our poetry shouldn't be there. I mean, you know, I, my, my whole thing is like, and it's ironic that I'll say as a translator, I'll say like in my creative writing, my, my whole thing is to not translate, um, you know, despite uh, the actual translations of my Aji stuff, which is like the weird disconnect for me. Um, but anyhow, uh, so I think that that's one of the things, I mean, think about responsibilities to like personal and emotional responsibilities to yourself, to your, to your, um, your guardians. Um, and then to like your community, your family, familial community, and then also like extending it outward like that. Um, how much of the story is what people don't want you to tell? How much of the story is what people are afraid that you'll tell, um, et cetera. I think personally that for me, um, I, I think that the more skeletons we have in our closet, um, in our closets, the more, um, the, the less likely we are to feel as, good about ourselves and our own just decisions and lives and so I think that like if more people from you know my my mom's family talked my mom's family specifically talked about queerness I think like they would find out that they all have much more in common than um uh, or or that they could be like more fulfilled and a little bit happier uh knowing that they're not the only ones going through this struggle so there's that part and the other thing about this is um kind of of like my process of translation, my process of translation. It's, um, I, I, there's a, a Anishinaabemowin poet um, named Margaret Newden, who uh, writes in um, her language, her native language, um, and her ideas around translation are, I think, some of my favorites. Um, she talks about translation as transformation, moving from a native, her native language into English is not going to be there's not going to necessarily be correlation um, in meaning, but rather it's kind of like a migration of thought and not a one for one kind of, you know, uh, migration of lexical definitional synonym. Um, and so I, that's something that I let happen for me in my translation. I really love having the actual original text in the original language present too, because I like to also think of translation as uh, an, a po one possible emanation from the original text. So I say that my translation is my own transformation, which is only just one possible emanation of the multiverse that could be the translation of the original. I hope that I hope that answers the question. I'm sorry to like um, not be so concise here. No, and we were kind of putting pressure on you because of the of times too. So. Um, I do want to res be respectful of your time and others too, and thank you so much for joining us. And, and I hope that next time you reach here, you'll actually be here. Um, it would be so lovely to have you here and to be like in your presence. Um, but thank you so much. And thank you to all of those who attended and asked questions. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but um, I wanted to say just a couple of quick things to wrap up. One is that, um, the visiting writer series continues right in, in two weeks. We have Professor Brendan, our very own Professor Brendan Shimoda, um, reading as part of the series, and that'll be on October nineteenth at five p.m. And then I wanted to close and end by by really thanking you, Rajiv, and I, we've been reading your work in my class, which is on 
you know, multi-ethnic US literature, which is a big topic. Um, and we've been thinking about how we can keep redefining the genre and, and um, that it is not just this purely voyeuristic uh, like form of literature. And, and a line from your author's note at the beginning of Anti-Man, right, where you say that you've, you're representing the emotional truths that have led you um, to the present. Like, we just thought that was such a great way to think about um, ethnic literature right, as these emotional truths. So thank you. And I think all of your answers to our questions um, have really like emphasized that, right? That it is about um, custodianship, right? Um, versus preservation um, or like trying to, to record like truth and, and like pure fact. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all those who joined us this evening. Um, have a wonderful night and we will see you at the next reading. Thank you, thank you so much. What a complete honor and such wonderful questions, my goodness.